Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with the city manager of Rancho Palos Verdes, R. Moranian, and our city's public works director, Ramsey Awad. It's great to have you gentlemen here back at Ladera Linda Community Park, where I can't believe days ago we were here on April 17th, where our city had a very interactive landslide town hall meeting that brought the community together again to discuss the ongoing state of emergency in our city right now with the landslide that we've seen accelerated movement for months and you're out there working on this that town hall meeting was a great way to inform our community but there were many questions that were raised that we didn't get to at that town hall meeting and that's where we're picking it up now to have a conversation and discuss answers that we want about what's going on with our city's efforts thank you liz i mean it, it was literally a week ago uh today that we had the town hall meeting with with a, a, a panel that consisted of not only staff and and Mayor Cruikshank and Councilmember Bradley, which are the city council subcommittee members for the Portuguese Bend landslide, but we also invited the city's uh, geologic team, both our geotechnical engineer as well as our city geologist, and we invited the utility companies and members of the um, the two geologic hazard abatement districts, also known as the GADs. We invited uh, Steve Cummins as well as Gordon Leon representing both Klondike Canyon Landslide Abatement District and Abalone Cove Landslide Abatement District. And it, we had approximately 400 um, participants and attendees both in person and, and participating virtually. And we, we received several comment letters, but the, the presentations took up pretty much the whole three hours. And at the very beginning, I had announced that we were only, we're gonna to try to keep it to three hours because we didn't want to spend the whole evening there. And so by the time it came to the Q&A part of mm -hmm. the, um, the town hall, we ran out of time. And so we thought this is a great uh, opportunity to record and continue um, as a video to, uh, the Q&A um, so that the, the public can watch the whole town hall and then also see our responses to the comments that were raised that evening. Right. I'm sure, Ramsey, as Public Works Director, your inbox is filled all day long with residents asking questions about what we are doing as a city to deal with the, the un unprecedented accelerated movements with all the rain. Um, but your thoughts on that town hall meeting, the goals that you had to inform our residents, how you thought it turned out. And again, we're going to continue to share information right now, but just your thoughts. Yeah, the landslide is our top priority in public works. Of course, we have other city business that we attend to, which is also important. The landslide is our top priority, and we get a lot of questions, a lot of requests for information. Um, and so it was very uh, good in my perspective to have a single uh, evening dedicated to providing that information where many people could have uh, firsthand, could hear firsthand that information and have uh, easy access to the experts that have contributed to putting together uh, the the uh, large amount of information about the landslide. Right. Well, I just want to personally thank you both as a resident for all you're doing. You were just nonstop, and everybody's concerned and wants to, you know, what are we going to do to resolve the situation? So with that, I'd like to just get to the, some of the questions that our residents are asking, starting with number one, I think, is everybody's wondering, are we at risk? of a sudden catastrophic event happening with a landslide? So we've asked our city geologist as well as our geotechnical engineering team that's been involved in this landslide project for many years, and they've re reviewed years, decades of reports and studies on the subject, and they've all reached the same conclusion, which is uh, they don't believe that a sudden catastrophic landslide failure that would uh, put lives in immediate danger is uh, in, in the realm of possibility at this time. Okay. And with that, I, I think it would lead into what people also think about what's happening with Palos Verdes Drive South with the ski jump bumpy road that we all deal with. I think there's, what, 15,000 cars a day that are using that road. Um, and a question that was asked is, what is the future of that road right now? And are, are we going to see it closed down? Because that will obviously have a huge impact. I don't know if you want to start with that one. Well, and maybe, ta you know, Ramsey and I can both tag team on this. Like you said, I mean, it is it is a major arterial roadway for the city. It, it carries approximately 15,000 trips. And it's not just local residents that use that roadway. It's it's visitors to Taranay and Trump National. It's, it's employers that are coming or employees that are coming to work here on the peninsula, and it's as well as commuters who are coming from Palos Verdes Estates or Rolling Hills Estates and, and driving towards the freeway. So it is, it is an important 
um, roadway for the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And so I, I know we're, we're watching the condition of the road very carefully and maybe Ramsey can. And we, we inspect the road on a regular basis and we conduct repairs very regularly to keep the road uh, in the best possible shape uh, so that the 15,000 or so vehicles that use it daily continue, can continue to do so. We're also working on a more significant repair for the ski jump. Mm -hmm. uh, it is subsiding and uh, we think that at some point we will need to do a little bit more significant grading uh, to counteract that subsidence. Uh, of course, we want to do that in a very carefully thought out way in terms of impacts to emergency services, to uh, school traffic, and of course to uh, residents. And so we're looking at doing that at the right time uh, with the right work hour parameters and the right traffic setup so that we can minimize the impact. Right, because I think residents, and one of the questions is like, how long would a closure be? I mean, would it be days? Would it be weeks? Would it be just intermittent? So we just have to wait and see what, what you're going to... Propose. Yeah, we think it's going to be on the order of days, not weeks. Okay. And we're looking at various That's much options. better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ideally, we don't have to close the road, and maybe we can do one repair one side um, at a time so that the road could remain open. But we're still exploring what the options are, and we'll try to minimize the, the impact to the community. And like Ramsey said, we hopefully can just do it over a few days if we have to do a, a temporary closure. Okay, as I look at the list of questions, I'm gonna jump ahead to a, one of the residents' questions had to do about PV Drive South and the concept of having it become a toll road, um, you know, making the case that this isn't just our PV drivers that are using, residents that are using it, and that we all need to kind of, you know, spread the spread out who's gonna pay for all this. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this uh, concept of actually having PV Drive South become a toll road to help pay for it? it, it it's an interesting question, and, it, and it's being asked in, in, a, in a variety of ways. One is to uh, limit the number of vehicles that use it by, by establishing a toll. The other is the toll could be used as a, a generator of funds to help maintain the road. And the way I would respond initially is it's a public road and we use public dollars to maintain that. And if we started to um, assess a toll to use it, there's a question whether it, it, you could still continue to use public dollars to maintain it. And and not only that, the other, the other response from my perspective is we have said and we continue to say and we believe that this is this is a, a major arterial roadway as i said earlier and and not only is it open for our residents but it, it but it serves the whole peninsula and of our businesses and our residents right yeah and i think that highlights the importance of pv drive south being a, a, a regional road and that the landslide is not just a city problem it's a regional problem uh, because of the impact on pv drive south and other infrastructure and in our various grant applications, we've highlighted the fact that PV Drive South is a regional roadway, uh, and, and uh, that just goes into the importance of regional funds to solve this regional problem. Looking at some of the specific questions, uh, I'm going to start with a resident that asked, um, with FEMA and Cal OES declaration sign-off, has the city considered including GAD mitigation plans in the larger EIR project, it seems like resources could be optimized and time saved. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the, qu the question has to do with the uh, geologic hazard abatement districts, both K-clad and A-clad, and whether we could expand our project, which is the Portuguese Band Landside Remediation Project, to include these two um, districts. And I I mentioned this at the actual town hall. If you watched the town hall meeting, one of the reasons why we were having this town hall was to explain um, what each entity's jurisdiction is and responsibilities. The city has been focusing on Portuguese Bend and its remediation efforts because it's outside of the boundaries of the districts that are responsible for landslide mitigation measures. And so the city was responsible for the Portuguese Bend and our project was developed going back to 2016 specific to this area. So um, I think because the, the, uh, the state and the federal government have both, those branches of government have, have declared states of emergencies and a federal disaster, that enables resources for the city and the two districts, but it doesn't mean that we have to revise our project to include it in the EIR. I think the two districts um, 
are able to move forward with their projects without having, in fact, the, the state of emergency relaxes some of the state permitting and, and requirements that they may not have to go through environmental review to do their remediation work. Do you also want to comment on this? Yeah, we're pretty far along in the PV, uh, sorry, in the Portuguese Bend uh, landslide remediation project in terms of grant funding, in terms of the environmental process and the project plans as well. And so we would just want to reduce the likelihood of uh, having to backtrack on any of that. Okay. People are wondering about if there's any idea on information on individuals' FEMA assistance. We're talking about funding for the landslide, but what about for the individuals dealing with right. this? Right, and, and that question came up as well as the yes. town hall. And when, when the city council requested the governor to declare a state of emergency, the, the request also included asking the governor to request the president declare a federal disaster. And the way that works is when the governor submits that request to the president, it, it, the request is very specific. And it is my understanding that the governor's request was specific for public assistance, not individual assistance. And so when the president declared the federal disaster on April 13th, it was only under the category of public assistance. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that individual assistance won't uh, be deployed or available. We're monitoring uh, what uh, activities or what information comes from FEMA as well as Cal OES. There's an opportunity where uh, individual assistance may be available through um, an SBA loan. That still hasn't been determined, and so we're waiting for any directives regarding that aspect of individual assistance. There is a lot of questions that had to do with Cal water. I mean, obviously the issue with the landslide is too much water and getting water out, um, and the issues of utility lines breaking. Um, do you have a timeline uh, that they want to know about Cal water's timeline for uh, putting problematic water mains in Seaview and in the Portuguese Bend Beach Club uh, above ground. I feel like they gave that part of the presentation as well, right, at, at the town hall, but for someone had asked that about just sort of what's going to happen there in the problem areas with the water lines. What should residents know? Yeah, Cal Water has already placed some of their mm -hmm. uh, water lines above ground in the Seaview neighborhood, um, and they have plans in the uh, Portuguese Bend uh, so community association neighborhood as well. Uh, I would also encourage residents if they'd like to join the weekly Wednesday landslide stakeholder meetings. Uh, that's also a really good way to get updates from Cal Water on a week to week, week to week basis with respect to their schedules on that work. Right, and one resident wrote that the water line, they live in Portuguese Men Beach Club, has broken nearly a dozen times, um, doing the same repair over and over, and they wanna know, will Cal Water reimburse for any of the damages done? What do you tell residents that are trying to get reimbursed for, for water pipe breaks? For, for water pipe breaks. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, um, the question should be directed to the Cal Water hotline. Yep. And maybe you can um, identify that phone number um, on this video here. And, and I know when Cal Water spoke and gave their presentation, they included some slides that showed where their phased above ground um, projects are located. We're gonna move on to talk about the city of Rolling Hills. There's been numerous questions submitted about Rolling Hills and what their plan of action is considering water is coming down the hill. So how do you want to, what do you want to tell residents that are wondering how are we working with the city of Rolling Hills and how are they proactive in helping to, to resolve the mitigation measures that are need to happen to, uh, to reduce the water in the slide? And the concern is a legitimate concern because when you look at the watershed, especially in the Klondike Canyon landslide abatement district area, the watershed uh, goes upslope and upslope uh, behind us is, is Rolling Hills. And this question came up and actually was one of the three questions that I was able to respond to before we reached the nine o'clock hour at the town hall. And Rolling Hills has been at the table with the city for a, for a long time regarding this. In fact, they attend the working group meetings, which mm -hmm. we meet every Wednesday at three o'clock and they last about an hour and a half um, long and it includes all the stakeholders and they are equally eager to address this issue and what's interesting and it's it's worth pointing out is 
The city did a hydrology study for the Portuguese Bend area, and we haven't done a hydrology study, nor has the district uh, KCLAD done a hydrology study for um, the Klondike Canyon area, which includes the Flying Triangle. So I, I mentioned this at the town hall that what we'd like to do is, is continue to collaborate, because we are collaborating with Rolling Hills, and work together to have a hydrology study so we understand where the water source is coming from and how much water is coming from the different sources to identify how we can address um, the, the, the water sources that are called out in the hydrology study. One of the residents has said that, um, that they're basically, when it comes to Rolling Hills concrete plans, they don't feel like they really understand what their long-term solutions are there. Um, it says 107 RPV homeowners are being expected to remove water that should be diverted by the city of Rolling Hills. Um, and we've seen that collaboration will reduce the individual burden that pooling limited resources benefits everyone appreciates coming to the table. So we'll just stay tuned and keep listening. And, uh, and I think it's a fair statement yes. to say that um, there are homes in the Flying Triangle that are in the city of yep. Rolling Hills. And, and I think both the city and their community association are equally concerned about the impacts this landslide is having because they're feeling it as well. And we just need to, to develop a road map forward so that we can collectively work together and we need to, at the table needs to be a Klondike Canyon Landslide Abatement District as well. Right. And wrapping up about Rolling Hills, like one of the residents said, because Rolling Hills is on septic too and there's runoff, um, what can our PV residents really do about this? And it's it's really, it's it's Rolling Hills. <laughs> right. So the question needs to be asked to Rolling Hills and, and we don't know how much water is contributed to the, the septic systems and irrigation. So a hydrology study will help um, make that calculation. Okay. So I'm jumping around with some of these questions. One of them was, will the city provide materials for homeowners to fill cracks on private properties? Well, I'll, I'll just explain that um, one of the things that we've been doing is providing material to fill cracks and to fill um, fissures that is in the front lawns of people's homes, but actually in the public right-of-way. And some folks may not know that the public right-of-way often extends into the front lawns by several feet or more of people's homes. So we can help folks identify that in the cases where there are fissures and there are uh, uh, cracks, we can, we can assist with that. Okay. Um, a question here is with the alarming land movement we've been seeing in the city, um, especially in Sevier, which is, happens to be my neighborhood right here. Um, is the city going to be denying permits for larger new construction projects that are not just necessarily in the in the K-clad, um, in the Klondike Canyon landslide abatement district, but also near the border, um, uh, considering all the water line breaks that we're seeing in Seaview? This is one <laughs> of the other questions I responded to at the town hall. There is, so the council, when they... Um, when they declared a, a local state of emergency back on October 3rd, one of the actions that took place that evening was also adopting an urgency ordinance, putting a moratorium in effect for the entire landslide more, uh, complex. It's only within those jurisdictional boundaries. And so if there's a project immediately next door, but not in those jurisdictional boundaries, there's no legal way, means to prohibit someone from going through the development process. As I mentioned at the town hall, they will have to go through the planning process. The planning process involves getting approvals from the city geologist saying that the, the project is not going to be impacted or will impact the landslides. So that process, it has to go through the process um, in order for a determination to be made. We cannot outright prohibit outside of the moratorium that was enacted by the council. Would it be possible to require all roof drainage from residential homes to be directed, piped, and deposited into the storm drain or even the sewer system? I think that what uh, proper design for uh, these roof drains, having them conveyed into the curb and gutter is appropriate and does convey the water onto the catch basins. Well, let me explain that another way. If okay. the water from a roof drain is uh, deposited into the curb and there are no cracks and we stay on top of filling the cracks in the landslide area and the curbs and in the adjacent pavement, 
then that water won't infiltrate into the ground. It'll continue, the, it'll be channelized through the curb onto the appropriate catch basin and through the uh, drainage system. Okay. In fact, and if I can yes, add go, to that, yes, um, it, what I mentioned at the town hall was the history behind the formation of the geologic hazard abatement districts and their charter. And there were, the, the city had hired a geologist, our city geologist at the time, which is the Robert Stone, um, a geologist for a geo geologic firm, and they prepared a, a study and included a plan of control, which essentially says what the, the what the two districts would need to do. And one of the items that they call out in that plan of control in the geo in the geology report is actually a recommendation that roof drains uh, be properly conveyed into a storm drain system. There's a lot more questions regarding Cal Water. I know I was at the town hall meeting, of course, and they were addressing. Um, but one of the questions is just who is doing the research to look into the source of the Cal Water main breaks? How do, you, how do we find all this information out when a water main breaks and is Cal Water does the research? Or that was the question. Yeah, we, we can often see the physical evidence of a, of a, a, a Cal Water main break. And uh, we sometimes ask Cal Water to show us pictures of the break condition. And often what we see is that it is uh, pipes that are being pulled apart because of land movement. There's a question about the lining of Altamira Canyon complex. And the question is, is money from the LA stormwater tax going to be available to contribute to the lining of Altamira Canyon complex? And if so, how much and when? So I'm not sure which LA water, uh, LA stormwater tax uh, is referred to here. Okay. Um, if it is the measure W stormwater uh, that it has very specific restricted uses and Altamira Canyon would not qualify uh, for that uh, funding. So do, would you know if money from the uh, federal disaster declaration would be available to contribute then? I think that's something that um, ACLAD is researching and that is probably uh, okay. something that they'll put forth uh, as one of their requests. And with the Army Corps of Engineers? Um, how, what's, how about what's going on with them and assisting with that lining of the canyon? Yeah, they'll, they'll have a role in that as well, and, and that's part okay. of the process. There's a lot of questions here regarding that. If you want to, besides funding, what else is preventing the lining of the canyon immediately? Um, multiple engineering plans are in place already. Um, so, the question about sort of what's going on, what's, why is there a holdup? There, there are a lot of um, variables as to actually implementing a lining of any canyon. I mean, mm -hmm. whether it's Altamira Canyon, Kelvin Canyon, Klondike Canyon, it's not, it's not as simple as to go in and, and uh, line the canyon. There's environmental review that's required. And at a minimum, you, you need to do the CEQA analysis to determine what the impacts are. Mm -hmm. But it is a blue line stream. So of course, the Army Corps of Engineers are gonna be involved. And then you also have to look at the funding. and. Are there other alternatives to address um, the the flow in that canyon to prevent it from from recharging the groundwater? I think we need to explore all those options. I know the city has done studies. The Harris studies was was done, and we we continued to work on that that completing that study. But we also need to work with the district because. Um, Altamira Canyon lies within the jurisdictional boundaries of Abilene Cove Landslide Abatement District as well. So they have a role in this as well. Okay. Yeah, and the city supported the district in their discussions with the LA County Flood Control District um, and will continue to do that. It says, what are the landslide risks for the Palos Verdes Bay Club area on Seagate Drive? Yeah, the Bay, the Bay Club is outside the jurisdictional boundaries of the landslide. So that holds the, the lower Abalone Cove neighborhood and even upper Abalone Cove. They're, they're not in the, uh, the, the boundary limits of the ancient landslide complex. And so the, the geologists, we, we've asked that question is, is, as we notice that the landslide is expanding, in fact, it's about 600, the active area is about 675 acres in size now. It, it's grown considerably from what we've been documenting over the last 50 years since the city incorporated. The city geologist doesn't believe that um, beyond the ancient landslide complex boundary lines that, that those properties are in jeopardy. Okay. And I want to expand on that because in public works, I've been receiving calls and emails from various residents that are concerned that although they're not seeing any movement, they haven't historically been 
in a landslide area that they may be impacted. And so what we do in those cases is we look at the historical boundaries of the ancient landslide complex. Uh, those calls are coming typically from folks that are outside of those historical boundaries. I consult with the city geologist and let folks know that if they are outside of the boundaries, it's completely different geological makeup. Since the declaration in October of the state of emergency has happened, you know, like you, I know this, I've watched the staff is working around the clock. What do you see as the, the way we can measure that we're making progress? We, we all want to resolve this issue and slow the movement, but like, I don't know if you can point to steps that you think that, that you're, that you're, that make you optimistic that we are handling this and we will, we, we will be able to resolve this. I'm just curious. You know, maybe we could both respond yeah. to it. From my perspective, first and foremost, I think from the very beginning when we started to see this uh, increase in the rate of movement, I thought it was very important that the council was made aware of it and the public and to be as transparent. And I recall um, having a conversation with the city geologist and he was explaining what he's observing and what the data is um, pointing to. And I immediately said, we need, you need to come to the council meeting. You need to present this information. Do not sugar, sugarcoat it. Right. We need to hear exactly what's happening so we can plan ahead. And um, for, for a very long time, we've, the city's been focusing on Portuguese Bend. And that's been where we've seen um, historically the, the movement that um, has been concerning to the city. And so we, that's why we developed our Portuguese Bend Landslide Remediation Project, which has three components to it to deal with um, surface water and surface water recharging the groundwater and trying to extract the groundwater. And we've been talking to um, every branch of government, all of our electeds to, to support us on this and to help us not only get through the process, but also um, assist us with, with the financial means to make this happen. And, and of course, we got selected for the BRIC grant to help fund this. But I think from my perspective, um, every, every effort we make to, to slow down this landslide, we've never said that we would stop it. Um, that, that's very important. We've never said we could stop it using engineering, but we think we can significantly slow it down. And what I'm trying to do and working with the team is is get those hydroggers installed and, and extract the water from the ground to, um, to, to slow down and stabilize the landslide and working with the two districts as well, recognizing that they're public agencies and they're, they have access to a lot more resources than I think they, they realized they had. And so helping them as well so that we're all working together. We're, we're, we're a community trying to find a solution to to what what is what is an act of nature right your thoughts on this too as we've been many months in now and we've watched you know miles of trails have closed you know you know unfortunately one red tagged home is too many and there's been several uh, but considering how many homes are in our city we're hanging in there right because there's about 400 homes that are in the klondike i mean in the abatement district areas that are, are being impacted right and then of course we saw wayfarers chapel closed down a lot of things going on and um so there are only two residential structures that That's have been red tagged. Only two, not yes, several. Yes. And and um, yes, and then the way, one of the buildings on uh, the Wayfarers right. uh, Chapel, uh, not the chapel, but one of the buildings on that campus Correct. has been yeah, red tagged. Yeah, their administrative office that used to be their visitor right, center. Right. So knowing all this, what what are your thoughts? As we're months in now and and working around the clock. Yeah, what makes me optimistic is that I think we've seen a lot of progress in how we are tackling this problem. Uh, in Public Works, we are now hyper-focused on the emergency hydroggers at the urging of the City Council and with the flexibility that the City Council has given us. So I believe that there are viable engineering solutions that are now on the table that we're working very hard to implement as quickly as possible. And certainly they have challenges, but I think we can overcome those challenges and work to implement and work with the districts. Um, mm -hmm. I believe Klondike Canyon Hazard Abatement District has a uh, specific plan that we want to support to get them to move that forward that I think will have a real impact on the ground. And the same can be said for ACLAB with the measures that they've been taking. New wells that they've been installing, I think it's been six new wells over the past several months. That's mm -hmm. a big step forward and they've got more uh, work lined up. So that's what makes me optimistic that we have solutions defined and we're working to implement them as quickly as possible. It says, is there anything homeowners can be doing to prevent further erosion on properties? What are your suggestions there? 
I think going back to the original question or, or an earlier question about dealing with surface water on their property, especially with all the rain that we're receiving, if if residents within um, just in general throughout the community, they need to properly or ensure that runoff is properly being conveyed to a storm drain system so that it just doesn't sheet flow over the property and not only cause damage to their to the structure, but also if there's fissures or openings in the ground, it just invites more water to percolate and recharge the groundwater. I, jumping back now to the hydro augers, as what is the timeline? That was a question I, I skipped that people want to know, like what, what's happening with that implementation of those measures. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to explain a little bit about the hydro augers. Um, the first step in installing the hydro augers, and when I say hydro augers, what I mean is a hydro auger array that typically consists of five uh, underground pipes that extract water. The first step before we install those uh, hydro auger arrays is to uh, drill uh, borings to better understand what's underground, better understand the slide plane thickness, the slide plane uh, angle, and other information about the uh, slide. So that's the first thing that's going to happen, and we're, we're working on that happening uh, in the next couple of weeks or shorter. Uh, and then that'll be followed by the hydro augers pretty quickly thereafter. We need to analyze that information and use that information to finalize some of the specifics on the hydro augers. So we're talking weeks here. We're talking our goal is in the month of May to begin uh, the hydro auger um, water extraction. And a fantastic way, I think, for the community to also just stay informed is to watch the city council meetings. You're addressing these issues all the time and then you're going into great explanations. You see the city geologist's findings. I think it's a great way to really understand what's going on so that the community is being informed rather than alarmed because let's face it, does it's when you we know we have North America's most active landslide in our community. Right. As beautiful as Rancho Palos Verdes is, right? We were dealing with this. Yeah, and we're really eager to get started on the work. I'd like to get out there tomorrow and get started, but it's a big investment. And we want to make sure we get it right. So I think it's really important for us to, to make sure that we do it in a calculated way so that we have the most impact possible. Right. And we're doing a lot of peer reviews to make sure that one expert um, is making statements or, or recommending certain things and, and another expert is is peer reviewing it to meet to ensure that what we're going to do is going to yield the best results for the community right i, I may probably should have asked this question earlier but i think that um to help for residents that are watching um, that don't really understand, we're not going to go to the history of, of the landslide, but to understand the complex area, which is actually made up of multiple slides. I think for so long we always said Portuguese Bend, but it's those three areas. And to give a little ex explanation, we keep talking about the uh, Abalone Cove landslide abatement district and the Klondike Canyon abatement district. Will you just do a quick explanation for people that have been listening so they can understand how this, what this all is, the complex area, and those districts. The ancient landslide complex is actually made up of five subslides, and Portuguese Bend is sort of in the center, and that's the Portuguese Bend landslide. Although the whole, the 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 name is actually the ancient Portuguese Bend landslide complex, but it's got the five. You've got the the centerpiece, which is Portuguese Bend. To the west is the Avalone Cove landslide. To the east. To the upper is the, uh, which is primarily in, in Rolling Hills, is Flying Triangle. Mm -hmm. Below that is, is the Klondike landslide. And then within the Klondike landslide is, is the beach landslide. So those five make up the landslides. And, and I know we, didn't want to, we don't want to go into the history of it, but, but this wasn't moving until 1956 when um, LA County was, ex extending um, Crenshaw Boulevard to the ocean, and they activated this ancient landslide. And what makes it um, known as the largest, fastest moving landslide is that it hasn't stopped moving. And not only geographically, the area is massive, but it hasn't stopped moving since 1956, where you ask that question about what is catastrophic. And typically a landslide, it moves and then it stops. Ours hasn't stopped, and, it, and it's fluctuated over, over the years in terms of its rate of movement. In the late 70s, so the city incorporated in 73, and in the late 70s, um, there, was, there was an acceleration in the movement, and residents in the Avalone Cove area were looking at ways to address the, the increase in rate of movement, nothing like what we're seeing today. Um, and so the city did char... Uh, 
charged uh, Robert Stone to prepare a GEO report, and there were recommendations. And essentially, the recommendation was to, to install these dewatering wells. And so the residents did that on their own in that neighborhood. They they paid for it out of their own pockets, and and put in some dewatering wells. Meanwhile, what what um, the city council at that time and former mayor Ken Dida uh, was working with Senator Beverly at the time, and they they wrote legislation that would form in the state of California these geologic hazard abatement districts. And so that legislation passed in, I believe, 1980, and soon thereafter, the residents um, formed their own geologic hazard abatement district. And essentially, it, it empowers them and gives them autonomy and their own authority to do things without having to go through um, the city's review process, the permitting, the, there are geologic hazard abatement districts, they're, they're exempt from certain state permitting requirements, and it's all within their own um, abilities. They do run it by the city, but it gives them their own autonomy. And that, that's one of the um, reasons, the primary reason why uh, Abalone Cove Landslide Abatement District was formed, and then the next year, as the second one in the state of California, was the Klondike Canyon Landslide Abatement District. And regarding when you're in that those two districts, since the boundary shifting, one one of the questions was is will more homes now be included in those districts, and how does that happen? Like who says okay now this house should be included in that district? So, so, the pro so we we've said this: the property lines don't move. Um, improvements may move, but the property lines don't move. So those property lines are 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 set um, based on maps that are recorded with the LA County. And, and they're all based on data markers. And so those jurisdictional boundary lines don't change. The improvements move. Right. Um, I'm looking through the questions because, we, again, we wanted to make sure at that town hall meeting, at the, the community that came out had their um, concerns addressed. And I think we've kind of covered the majority of them. I want to ask you to, since you're constantly talking with the residents, are there issues that you want to bring up as well. Um, I want to thank the residents, especially in the Seaview neighborhood, that report to us where they see cracks in the roadway and um, fissures, um, uh, cracks in the curb, so that we can get out there quickly and get those repaired, especially in advance of storms. Uh, that really helps us deploy resources in the most optimal way so that we're, we're not spending a lot of extra time looking for those things. So thank residents for that and ask them to continue to do that. Uh, residents have been extremely patient with us, and, and that's also greatly appreciated. Um, it's a tough challenge for us to solve. We're doing everything mm -hmm. that we can. We're focused on this as our top priority and will continue to be. Uh, and I also personally appreciate the partnership from the Geologic Hazard Debate, Abatement Districts as well as the other stakeholders. Um, I feel really optimistic that we're working together to make progress on this. Yeah, yeah that, that open line of communication has been very helpful. I mean. I say this often that we're in a state of crisis. The city's in a state of crisis, and in in, in times of crisis, um, people come together, and the community has come together, and there's been a lot of collaboration, a lot of communication between all the parties. And as Ramsey said, um, we we rely heavily on the the residents to let us know what's going on, on in their neighborhood. We're not out there, and especially these rain events, it seemed like it's been raining on the weekends. We were getting all the rain on the weekends, and so um, it, it was very much appreciated that people were telling us what the situation is, sending us videos of areas that need immediate attention, and when they contact us, we were able to immediately deploy the resources to address the concerns, and I think that that communication tree has been very important. I mean, we're learning a lot of um, a lot of lessons are being learned as we navigate through this crisis. And, and um, that's very important that we're open to learning and making changes and adjusting as, as we, we navigate through this. And someone, someone asked today on the working group meeting, like, when do we see, when do you think we're going to see um, some stabilization? And it's really hard to say. I mean, at this rate, so someone had said, we hadn't seen anything even in the 1980s when when um, they were experiencing the, the, the landslide was was moving. It was nothing like what we're seeing now, and so um, it's gone from inches in places to like feet at a time. Yeah, yeah. never seen anything like that. And because you're saying you want to continue to address residents' concerns, I just want to make sure because the focus today was to really be able to to go back to these questions that came up at the town hall that. 
Can you ex explain the benefits of putting hydro augers if, they if they're closer to the ocean? And what are the, depending on how you pick where you're placing them, is there a benefit? What are the pros and cons? And do you also think that would be a viable solution for Klondike Canyon? So the location for the hydrogers is selected um, for serve two purposes. One is to relieve artesian pressure, underground water pressure, right. uh, which facilitates landslide movement. And so those are installed at the toe of the landslide. So further down uh, PV Drive South and below PV Drive South uh, for that purpose. Also, the hydrogers that are installed further up are really more of an interceptor type of hydrogger that capture water that is going from the higher areas uh, in the slide and beyond uh, down to add to the uh, water that's at the toe of the slide. So it's really two different types of hydrogers that serve two different purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the overall landslide remediation project has both, and the emergency stabilization project also has one of each. Uh, so we, we believe that it'll be uh, quite impactful to relieve that artesian pressure coupled with the interceptor that reduces recharging as and well. Also to be clear, the water goes into the ocean. It doesn't actually get go into the land. Yeah, the water that's extracted from the hydrogers is then conveyed uh, into the ocean uh, after we make sure that uh, it meets right. water quality requirement. We're also even working with the LA County Sanitation District to see if we can convey it to um, the, san the sanitary system as well. So we, we're still exploring the options. Yeah, very similar concept in, in terms of discharging the water. It's a very similar concept to what ACLAD is using on their many wells, same, same type of approach. So we are now gonna take a quick break from the question and answer session here at Ladera Linda Community Park, but I wanna wrap up by thanking Ramsey. I know you've got a gate, business is calling you, so we wanna thank you for being here. Anything you wanna add? And I'm gonna continue on with our city manager after you, you leave us. Thanks, Liz, for having me. And I just want to take an opportunity to thank my team and Public Works Department. It's been an all hands on deck effort, folks working nearly around the clock. Uh, so I just want to thank them for all their hard work. Okay. And thank you for having me. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this with the city manager to wrap it up. All right, well, I'm here continuing the question and answer session with our city manager, R. Moranian. These are questions, of course, that were submitted to city staff at the city's landslide town hall meeting, which was amazingly attended. We've got more questions that I need you to try to answer for me. Right, and but, I'm going to try my best to answer <laughs> you, all these yes, questions yes. now that my partner has, yes, has, we, has left. We had our public works director for the first part of Q&A, and um, he's off doing city business. So we're going to continue with this. Um, very important information, though, to get out there. Uh, Ara, is there a plan to extend the Conqueror Trail drain so it reaches the main storm drain? Right. And so when, when they say Conqueror, because that's the Conqueror Trail that runs through Klondike Canyon. And so uh, what they're referencing is, are we going to be able to continue to, because there's a pipe that we've installed to convey the water to to the ocean. And so we are working with the district to to see how we can extend that pipe under the Conqueror Trail and continue upslope to the end of the city boundary line. Regarding the Klondike Canyon Klondike Landslide Abatement District, um, the community would like an update on the election they just had. Sure, that, that's a great timing because a week ago, we were still going through the process. And so last night, the, um, the actually not last night, the, on Monday night, it was the Klondike Canyon Landslide Abatement District held a meeting and they counted the ballots and there were two vacant seats that I am pleased to report are now filled by two residents. Excellent, excellent. Um, and regarding homeowners insurance, question has come up. Um, what are they? What is a homeowner going to do if their home if their homeowners insurance is canceled? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good question. I, I think insurance in general is is a concern for. Every, should be a concern for every resident uh, on the peninsula, uh, not only because of the landslide, but you know we're, the city is, uh, is a designated very high fire severity zone. And as we're hearing all over the news, insurance companies are leaving California. They're not issuing new policies. And that's just for fire insurance. And then when you add um, this landslide, concerns are, are, are legitimate at this point. And, and if your insurance company, if you file a claim, and I don't, you'd have to check with your insurance policy to actually see if you're covered for land movement. Many insurance companies cons do not consider that um, an item or, or, 
or an incident that is covered by insurance, you do need to talk to your insurance company and be very mindful of, of the claims that you're filing. And of course, if you um, are canceled, if your insurance is canceled, you should contact the state insurance board. Okay. Um, this landslide is not just RPV's problem, it's the community's problem. How is it affecting the entire peninsula and how are peninsula cities um, stepping up? I know we were focusing earlier as well on Rolling Hills and what they can do in their role, but overall the whole peninsula. Right. I think it's important to uh, let the community know, not only RPV residents, but the entire peninsula, that this landslide, this, this the Portuguese Bend ancient, ancient landslide complex, is isolated and concentrated to the area that is shown on the on the maps, and that it it's not. Um, correlated to any other land movement throughout the peninsula. Those are isolated um, geographic or geologic issues. And so uh, I would want to convey to the public that the what we're seeing here in the, in the Portuguese Ben Landside complex does not affect the entire peninsula. But certainly everyone driving PV Drive South are being impacted. And when the time comes that you have to do some closures to fix this road, um, what are going to be the alternate routes? Somebody asked that question. Yeah, we may we may not have an alternate route. Um, the we may, we may uh, consider uh, paving a dirt uh, or some sort of uh, road if there's a flat area that we can do that to so that vehicles can use that. But the reality is we're going to try to minimize the disruption of it, and hopefully it's the road closure. Is, is over a long weekend, so we don't have to do an alternate route. Some people have mentioned whether we want to direct traffic through um, the Portuguese Bend Community Association, and that, that isn't even an option. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know if you enter through the Narcissa Gate there, um, and right above uh, Wayfarers Chapel, they've, that road is very unstable, and they're experiencing some of their own um, roadway conditions and, and damage to their roads. So their roads cannot handle any more traffic. In fact, they're trying to direct their residents to the Pepper Tree Gate um, just because of the, the precarious situation of, of Narcissa, especially at that first curve. Okay, well, we'll uh, the city will be posting the community. The city is doing a, a good job too of when there's delays, at least residents are being made aware of what to expect. If we uh, are going to close the road for a long weekend or, or an extended period of time, we will uh, provide adequate notification if we can to residents uh, to, so that they can make alternate plans. Um, similar to what Caltrans does whenever there's a freeway closure, we'll try to let people know. Okay. I think the residents at the town hall will really try and also offer solutions, what they think could be helpful. When it comes to erosion, one of the residents asked, as a city, is anyone considering using um, certain types of plants that might help when you're doing the wells that would be done in conjunction that could help with erosion. Right, and I, I, I recall speaking to the, this resident who had, who had said, you know, there's certain plants that have a deep root system that may help stabilize uh, the land. And so they were saying we should, we should consider exploring those types of plants in addition to the hydrogers and the dewatering wells. And certainly that's something we will explore. I do know that this is a deep um, rooted landslide and it goes well deep into um, into the ground and so you may have a deep um, root system for plants but I don't think it goes as far down into right. the earth as as this land movement is occurring I mean you'd probably the idea is the root system would create some sort of um, retaining uh, barrier so that it, it would help stabilize and and the bentonite is well below the ground that you I don't think there is a, a root system that can go that far Mm -hmm. a, a resident asked, will RPV City take responsibility for restoring canyons to drain into the ocean? That's a good question. We, we've got several canyons that are within this landslide complex, and these are the natural watersheds. And the question, the question really is germane to surface water. And, and we, we, we often talk about the surface water and the runoff, especially during a rain event and, and the fissures in the ground recharging the, the groundwater table, mm -hmm. which is, is contrary to what we want to do. We, and that's why it's so important to make sure water is properly conveyed to the ocean. Currently, we know, um, and, and many residents have been tracking this and letting us know as well, including the two districts, is of the watersheds that, that uh, 
are supposed to convey water to the ocean, about 20% of that water actually ends up in the ocean. And we know the other 80%, and I'm just approximating here, is recharging the water table. So we are looking at ways to address these watersheds and to deal with surface water. And that's why our project, um, the Portuguese Ben Landside Remediation Project, includes one of the components, the three components, includes surface um, drainage swales so that it, it minimizes groundwater being recharged. Well, I think a resident also, one of the questions was about that water's impact when it's not getting drained into the ocean, how it's affecting actually Palos Fortis Drive South yeah, it, and the movement. Because of the, d the dam effect. And, and we know we've been saying this for almost the last eight years that the, the groundwater table is rising and, and PV Drive South is sitting on wet soil. And anyone who drives PV Drive South can see the effects of all this land movement. Throughout the town hall meeting and now through our question and answer period here, we have brought up financing. How is all this going to get paid for? How are we paying for all this? Or one of the residents wants to know, is any assistance going to come from the city to the um, to residents um, that are you know taking a big hit on their properties? Um, and many people have lost, it said upwards to a quarter of a million dollars. Personally, someone said just because of the slide, how can the city assist homeowners for recouping damages. Right, and, and there's two parts to this, this uh, response. I, I, I think the, there's, there's the public assistance, which I was talking about earlier, and there's the individual assistance. And the, the President de Declaration of a Federal Disaster did not include individual assistance. What may end up happening for residents is if, if Cal OES and the, and the governor decides to um, use the California Disaster Assistance Act, that may be able to uh, provide resources, funding resources to residents in, in the form of a loan, like an SBA mm -hmm. loan. The city, what the city is trying to do is, is help residents um, financially in the sense that if they want to do repairs to their structures we are waiving those permit fees. I think okay. that came up at the March 19th city council meeting. And we already have language in the municipal code that allows us to waive those fees. And we also want to expedite their permitting proce uh, process so that they can they can submit and we can immediately turn it around so that they can do repairs to their, stru their structure. The question keeps coming up, who's responsible for what? So this resident saying, you know, with respect to the landslide abatement and repairs, you know, is it LA County, is it RPV, is it Cal Water, you know, the Land Conservancy, HOAs, residents, like, how is this all determined? Um, for example, if they say if ACLAD manages the wells and the city of RPV manages surface water runoff, how does this all get <laughs> figured right. out? Who's paying for what? Right. And, and I mentioned this earlier yeah, as well, is, is the, the geologic hazard abatement districts were, were formed so that these, the the properties within these uh, boundary limits have autonomy and are able to do things expedited and without having to um, get approvals from the city. They're, they're their own special district. And so, and the city owns properties. We actually own um, significant uh, properties in both districts. And so it's the district's responsibility. And I know the question was, okay, if the, dis if, if the district is doing the dewatering, is the city responsible for for surface water, if you go back to the plan of control, which is the charter for the formation of these two geologic hazard abatement districts, it's clear that uh, their charter is to deal with groundwater as well as surface water. Right. Uh, and following up on this, a resident residents asking about when you know about getting your home inspected to sort of detail problems and maybe remediation from I mean, I'm sure residents are like, well, I don't want to get my home red tag. Like what, what, what are you telling residents about, you know, how to get inspected and um, just sort of an opinion on the pros of cons of, of just, you know, like it says here regarding like legal efforts being started to recover personal expenses once you open that door, right? To say, hey, look at my house. I think it's damaged. Like, what are you telling residents right. how to handle this? Well, I, I should first say that um, our city's, our, our city crew and, and not only the public works, but our building official, David Razor, he he drives the, the area, the neighborhoods several times a week and he is out there and people see his truck they know who he is now and 
He wants to make himself available. The city's uh, building and safety division is available. Uh, if, if a resident has a concern, a safety concern regarding their structure, they should contact the mm -hmm. city. We'll come out, we'll do an inspection. It's voluntary. We're not, we're not going in there and knocking on the door saying we're gonna inspect. But if you do have a concern, and I'm sure people do, um, especially if doors are not opening, windows are not opening, those are safety concerns. I mean, if there's, there, there's a fire and you can't get out of your structure quickly, that's a safety concern. And so talk to the building official, talk to the building and safety. Um, we will advise you to get in touch with the geotechnical engineer to make recommendations on how you can repair your structure and, and, and then submit those. And like I said, we will help expedite that review process. Okay. I think we got the questions in from the town hall meeting. As we wrap it up here, um, Going forward, what do you want residents to know? Obviously, this is the state of emergency that we're in is going to continue to come up before the council on how to handle the situation. Hopefully, we're entering May and the rains are done. Like, let's, I, I, things I will dry so. out here. I so, hope so, if anything, we're going to see, see the situation improve. Just what you want to put out there, messaging, uh, you know, even the possible future town hall meeting and things like that. It's really important that the community is kept in constant. Um, updates on on what's happening with this landslide this this is this is a very large uh, very concerning crisis that we're we're navigating and so i can't stress enough to the community to go to the city's website and to subscribe to our listservs we have the land movement listserv you will get electronic notifications we you mentioned earlier we the council is basically discussing this is on their agenda pretty much every meeting some item related to landslide is on the agenda but if you subscribe to the land, land movement listserv you will get notifications on what's going on we update the website every week it's updated and anytime new information's uh, coming our way we're updating the website we want to make sure the community is kept informed and engaged and and we may be coming to the end of this q a but Residents know how to get in touch with yes. me. They can email me at any time. Many people call me. Um, if you have questions, we're there. I think it's important for the community to, to know that their city is there for them. They're, the council's there for them. We have been and we continue to be there for, for residents. Um, any time of the day, residents know they can get in touch with me and and we will deploy resources when we need, when we're able to, to help people out. Right. Hopefully we'll see some more trails opening up soon. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that would be really, um, ideal, but I, at the, at, we know that it, the land hasn't slowed down. The movement hasn't slowed down and we continue to sustain a lot more damage to approximately eight miles of trails. I mean, uh, just a couple weeks ago, the Olmstead trail had a big rock fall landslide and that's that's a major route for, for the lifeguards. And so as we're approaching the warmer months and the beach is become um, used by the public, we, we also have to have contingency plans in place. Well, rpvca.gov is our city's website. Amazing amount of information, not, not just about the landslide, but everything happening in the city. And I'm also going to recommend that you subscribe to our city manager's newsletter that comes out every week, every Wednesday. every Wednesday. It is filled with incredible information, and you can really stay in tune with what's happening in those weekly Wednesday meetings. There's so many opportunities to be engaged and informed. And, of course, RPV TV. Yep. Um, we put everything out there and on the city website. That's going to wrap it up here at Ladera Linda Community Park. I want you, the city manager, to have the last word message to our residents as we continue to navigate the ongoing landslide. Uh, thank you. And I think it's, uh, I, for, as my last remark, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the, the staff and everyone who's been working, putting in countless hours to navigate this crisis and from Ramsey who was here earlier today and his public works team from from David Kopp and and Juan Hernandez and and the whole maintenance crew and all those and, and our, our vendors that are out there repaving the roadways and doing everything and being so responsive to the community and as well as all the the uh, other departments, whether it's the community development department and Brandy and her team and David Razor, the building official, Corey and Dan in, in Rec and Parks, who've been dealing with uh, with what's happening out in our open space areas, and, and Vina and our finance director, who's been helping us identify 
uh, funding sources. We want to be able to help the community. The council's looking at ways to provide assistance to the two districts as well as possibly the community association as well. So we need to just continue. We're we're a community. I can't stress this more than ever. And in, in times of, of crisis and disasters, communities come together. This isn't a time to be pointing fingers. We need to be working together and, and find solutions to stabilize this landslide. As our motto has been, let's stay connected. That's, that's right. RPV together, together, right? Always. Thank you again, City Manager thank Armorani, And thank you for tuning in to this update. And let's stay connected. And remember the city website rpvca.gov. See you next time. Take care.